Namaste. As part of uh, the reading of poems, today we'll take up the hill top temple. The background is that uh, it's a temple located in Pune. In in fact, uh, if you ask me, the most picturesque place. But people may disagree. But one of the most picturesque places in Pune. I don't know how it is now. So there is a huge garden. And then you enter, it's like a forest, mini forest, not a forest that way. But yes, a mini forest. And then you have this temple located on the top of what is known as Parvati Hill. And the history goes that the Peshwas had um, purchased that hill. One of the Peshwa rulers, Peshwas were working with, Shat, you know, the Shatrapatis who were like, you can say, the main king. And the Peshwas are like the prime minister who are actually governing. That's how we see the ancient... Maratha Empire arrangement <laughs> and we know how Sri has immortalized one of the Peshwas Baji Rao so they were warriors but uh, by birth they were Brahmins so they, they had this tact of governance but they were also warriors who fought so um, later on of course whatever happened to the empire and if you take it that Shivaji's rule was somewhere in the 1600 BC and the Peshwas who built this temple is somewhere around 1700. So, we don't know whether the idea or the seed was sown during the time of Shatrapati Shivaji Maharaj because he was a worshipper of Bhavani. So, the temple is dedicated to the Kuladev of the Peshwas, which was Mahadev. So, he was there and they used to be there war cry also, Har Har Mahadev. So even now the Marathas, when they go for war, you know, Maratha line in, in Indian army. So Har Har Mahadev is a Nara. Jai Bhavani is another Nara. So uh, the temple was dedicated the, at the top, the main temple, which is, a, you know, in black stone, is dedicated to Mahadev. But you have the goddess Parvati temple, which is regarded as the main shrine. And there are plenty of others, not plenty, but four or five other small temples dedicated to Surya, Sun God dedicated to Vishnu, uh, Kartike, uh, Ganesh, of course, you know, Shiva's family. Uh, so it's a beautiful place and you have to climb to the temple going through 108 stairs. Uh, when I read about this uh, temple in uh, this poem in Collected Works of Sri it says that the date that Sri visited the temple and had the experience was Probably 1902, but I doubt the authenticity of this. In all likelihood, it was 1908. And the reason why I say so is that, you know, there is not much account of Sri travel in the Baroda period uh, earlier. But after the Nirvanic experience, it's documented that he went to Pune. So if you take that the experience of Nirvana was uh, 7 January, he has gone to Pune. This temple, the date on which he visited was 12th January. So it fits very well into that scheme and of course uh, there is a way that the ordinary human being sees something and there is a way that the divine vision sees something and it is um, that eye we have to exchange with these eyes. So when we see a temple um, we may have all kinds of ideas. It's a ritualistic thing, it's a religion, it's all kinds of things. Some people may even say, oh, this is a nice architecture made out of stone. But, uh, well, to another eye, the temple is one, a sacred space. Wherever we dedicate a temple to a god or a goddess, by the power of faith and the worship and consecration by those who are dedicated to a, that particular god or goddess, especially in the lineage, the temple comes alive with a divine presence to whomsoever it is dedicated. And then, of course, apart from that, temples have a very, in, in India, temples had a very symbolic sense interwoven with it. So that's why if you go to um, see typical churches, they are beautiful but they are built by a rational understanding. There will be symmetry, there will be, you know, um, uh, the design will be such which will appeal to the rational mind. But if you go to an Indian temple, north or south or east or west, you will see that they are more symbolic representations than, uh, you know, the emphasis is not on rational symmetry. Uh, symmetry is there, of course, there is a beauty in that, but more, much more on the symbolism. 
So for instance, in this temple, the top is gold. So you'll hear about this gold being on top of a temple. Shabinda even describes that in Savitri. Um, it black dragon base and a top of gold. So here it's like it's climbing towards that supramental light, which cannot be seen and yet it is there. When mother gave the gold covering, if I may say so, to Matri Mandri, it meant that all has become golden. It is not just the top. And that gold is the supramental perfection. And so the entire thing, a rounded hole, it's a supramental perfection. That's what it signifies. So this, but this, this is a completely new form of architecture, a new form of understanding and building that the mother has started. But in ancient India, we'll see that these temples were largely symbolic. Shubhendra has written so much upon it. And in a certain sense, they recreated man's journey to the infinite. So, we have here 108 steps in the temple. Strangely, Wikipedia mentioned 103, but I am sure it is 108. So, of course, when I had gone to the temple, it was something very beautiful. And it was, of course, a little bit tiring to climb the steps, but it is worth it. It is a reminder that you can't just rush into, you know, <laughs> the divine house. So, that's why, that's another thing which Sri tells us that any Indian temple... You cannot dislocate it from the surroundings. It's not like later, I'm not talking of the later temples, you know, they started following that wherever you get a space uh, or, you know, the, the tendency to build a mosque just to occupy a space. That's not how Indian temples were created. They were created as a um, in a certain background. So many of these temples, especially South India, if you go southern part of India, you'll see huge spaces. I mean, there has to be something befitting. It's like before you enter, you have to enter into the mood, the atmosphere. You can't just rush to the divine. You have to enter into that state through which you go. So here also we'll see a kind of forest and then you enter. Then there are steps. There is a whole climb. And we all know 108 is uh, regarded as a sacred number. And for various reasons, that's a different subject altogether. Uh, it's like sacred geometry. So, you know, um, Indian mind, I think this was there even in the Western mind at some point of time, but it has been lost. We see Pythagoras and these people contemplating so much on sacred geometry. So something similar was there even in India that the number, the patterns, the designs and how they replicate some truth of the infinite. So one climbs through the steps and then one is face to face with Bhavani, Mata Parvati, and of course, we know she is the daughter of the mountain. So it's befitting that she sits on top of the hill from where you can see the entire Puna. So she is uh, atop a hill where you have 360 degrees views of the entire city. Then when you are face to face with her, she is none else but one who opens the doors to the infinite. So we start from the finite and we end up with the infinite. That is the whole journey. In a temple, a reminder but not only a reminder, even a space where it's much easy to uh, come in contact with the indwelling universal. People often ask that, you know, divine is everywhere. So why do we need to go to special places? Now that, of course, it has been answered in various ways that, well, water is everywhere, but you don't drink it from the mud water. You, you can do it technically. You can filter it and drink it but you prefer a water which is already available from a clean source. So these are spaces dedicated and uh, in ancient India, the spirit of the sense of the sacred was very much there. So these spaces are maintained in such a way to keep that spirit intact. So this is the background, but let's read the experience for a moment. Let our eyes be exchanged by Shurabindu's eyes. Let's see how he looked at the temple, the hill top temple. We know that... Uh, Another hilltop temple he speaks about is Shankaracharya. It's a much low-lying temple. But here, the hilltop temple, after unnumbered steps of a hill stair, so it's cut through the hill. The steps are not added structures. The hill has been turned into steps. I saw upon earth's head, brilliant with sun, the immobile goddess in her house of stone, in a loneliness of meditating air. You see this image, actually, it reminds one of um, the image of 
Mother Parvati in Keno Upanishad. So when all the gods want to find who this unknowable eternal was, so they cannot find. But finally Indra pursues her in subtle air and he is led to Uma Hemavati, which is another name for Parvati, the daughter of the mountains. Now it is very interesting why she is on the mountains, you know, Mount Kailash. So is on the peak of earth. At the same time, she has come so close to earth. That is something very interesting because Brahma Lok is somewhere in some ethereal region. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, Vishnu Lok, which is uh, Shir Sagar, is elsewhere. But we see that in upon earth, of course, Kailash is not a physical place, but on physical, we see some kind of a projection of this ideal place. Similarly, we see that Vrindavan is elsewhere, but there is an effort of the Rishis to project Vrindavan in a certain time and space. So this was the effort, um, to whatever extent it succeeded or, or didn't succeed, but Kailash, of course, is inaccessible, but one can go up to Mansarovar. So here is a temple which is replicating the goddess who is standing atop the earth. You have to climb there and mark the word she is immobile. But this immobility is all power. She is a solid mass. That's why we have the steps in the hill. She is Shakti, Adya Shakti. So she is seated also. When we read the triple, the, the three soul forces, we see a description that each of the goddess is seated in an appropriate seat. For instance, Durga is seated on a stone which is, you know, a boulder, which is like a throne. She is Durga. She's not sitting on a, you know, very nice rosy cushion. So here is the mother goddess sitting on, uh, in a house of stone, where she she's sitting alone. But to reach her, like the Kain Upanishad, Indra, we have to meditate and from the grass we have to enter into the subtle etheric realms. And then we may discover her sitting immobile and alone. We can't be carrying the whole world and let's go there. So this is a beautiful description in itself, a meditation. Wise were the human hands that set her there. So these temples were built with a lot of wisdom and understanding and insight. So why were, why were these hands wise above the world and times? Dominion, the soul of all that lives, calm, pure, alone, revealed its boundless self, mystic and bare. So it's on the height of heights. So that the whole scene actually makes us feel like that. If you see it from the ground, it's almost like being lost in the air. That's why Shivinda says you cannot understand these temples unless you see them both against the background, which is the ground reality and the skies with which it is merging. Actually, you have to see where is exactly the temple. The aerial views are different, but from the ground it seems to be lost in the infinitudes. And then as we climb slowly at some point, the temple begins to become clearer. So that's how in our journey to the divine, so they were wise hands, which have placed her, the temple, above the world and time's dominion. That is her, uh, that is where she dwells and yet from there she watches over the entire world and all its movements. So it's such a beautiful symbol. And who is she? The soul of all that lives, calm, pure, alone, revealed its boundless self, mystic and bare. Boundless cell, the sky above, no limits. Beyond it is only the sky. So, boundless self, mystic and bare. And now Sri says, what is it a symbol of? He draws that symbol at another level. Our body is an epitome of some vast. Our body is the temple, which is like some compressed reality is being expressed here, divine reality. Our body is an epitome of some vast that masks its presence by our humanness. So when we are going, it's like in a city, we don't know the temple, but it is there, it is there as the soul of the city, as the very much part of the city. But you can't find it if you are just going in the usual marketplaces and other places. 
So similarly, our humanness masks the divine presence, which it, which is hidden within us. In us, the secret spirit can indict. So indict is the, it can compose like you compose a poem. So this spirit is waiting for us to become blank pages. But we have pages which are uh, written. So many things have been written on this. So first it has to sometimes either use an ink eraser, which is very painful. Where is my old writing gone? <laughs> Maybe to add a new page, tear away the old one. But when we go to the divine with a, like a blank page for the divine to write, that's why the quietude of the mind, the stillness of the vital, all this is necessary. Then the divine will can be written there. So he says, In us the secret spirit can indict a page and summary of the infinite. A summary of the infinite at one place in uh, Savitri Shobindra uses the word describing the world here, stare as a compendium of the absolute. So absolute is, oh, everything is there inside the divine. So how do you reveal it? It's like when you write a book or a poem, you reveal all that is there in the heart of the author. Everything that is there is written, but put in the right place and just proportion. We put it in the wrong places and just proportion. We also write Mahabharata in, life, in our life. But we make Duryodhan the king. And we make Arjun not only suffer but lose. So that's our Mahabharata. Characters are the same. But the right place, the just proportion, that is what makes the difference. So in us, the secret spirit can indict a page and summary of the infinite. A nodus of eternity expressed. So it is something which is compressed. A challenge, a difficulty. In a knotted form, it has been placed there in, in a compressed form. A nodus of eternity expressed. Live in an image and a sculptured face. So the same thing which we discover, same thing within us. There is the temple of Bhavani inside us. And we have to, but for that we have to uh, enter within and climb the stairs. It can be a breathtaking climb. We may pant. Sometimes, because from the ground we cannot see. So we have to proceed with faith. And then, ultimately, we stand a lonely soul, loves thee alone. And that is how, through this process, we can discover. And then we discover that everything within us is arranged in a very symbolic way. See, this is the whole problem of earth. Everything is uh, there. Whatever is there in the divine is here. But in the divine, it is in a state of perfect proportion, perfectly. Here upon earth, it is out of place. So that's what creates evil. Because something which is not in its place or persists out of its turn and time. When anything persists like that, it becomes, uh, it loses the Ritchit. But if you look at it in terms of its journey through time, that's what I think morning that what's happened it's time a truth in its time and where it is placed that is the important aspect so he has placed the goddess on the top of the hill it's not like you have the goddess you do pranam and then climb on the top and have fun that's not how it is the goddess is on top of the hill <laughs> you go to hill to sit quietly and meditate and commune with the infinite this is the beautiful poem I'll just read it again and then we can stop. The hill top temple, after unnumbered steps of a hill stair, I saw upon earth's head, brilliant with sun, the immobile goddess in her house of stone, in a loneliness of meditating air. Wise were the human hands that set her there above the world and time's dominion. The soul of all that lives, calm, pure, alone. See, above time's dominion. Time cannot reach. Time cannot capture it. It is beyond the reign of time. Reveal its boundless self, mystic and bare. Our body is an epitome of some vast. That's what is meant by saying that the universe 
is within the body in in sanskrit they say within the pind there is the brahmand in fact in each finite there is the infinity if we again the kain upanishad story so we see here shubhendra is revealing a secret truth which is there even in the kain upanishad that within each finite there is the infinite so finite is a seeming and that's a fact so all this quantum entanglement as somebody was asking it's all indication that there is the infinite which is continuum because it's one at its root it is one and yet it gives the appearance of finites but you cannot understand the finites unless we understand the infinite infinite so that's the same thing with our human body and our human being if we even look at our body we will see from foot to head it's an amazing way that the human body has been composed so feet walk how much they walk little at a time mind brain can conceive thousands of years ahead so in the divine plan everything has been foreseen but in unfolding it takes time and then when we see all the panch tattvas arranged in such a way so there is the space it can expand endlessly and then there is the vayu tattva which comes speech expressive speech vayu tattva that's the first expression first stir and then you have the agni tattva whose seat is in the center and then you have the jala tattva if you look at the body all the jala tattva organs are all located in the abdomen where the problem comes the lower down you go the problem comes and then the muladhar the framework the prithvi tattva which holds everything together so that's how everything so, so the body is itself a temple it starts from there and climbs so that's how it is described in purushukta where the divine being who sacrifices himself is described as a, a human being in the image of a human being though actually human beings are built in the image of the purusha and if we look at it again the brahmanatva the kshatriya bhav the vaishyatva and the shudra bhav they all are represented in the human body and all the tatis crore gods and goddesses let people figure out where each one is but each aspect is governed by some aspect of the divine energy that was a very detailed knowledge which has been lost now because we just debate and argue rather than search and seek a body is an epitome of some vast that masks its presence by our humanness outside is the human inside is the divine so within us and within others if we bypass the human formula which is in the front we'll end up discovering the goddess who is inside in us the secret spirit can indict a page and summary of the infinite our life can become a song of the soul a story divine a rhythm of the infinite a wave of the supreme that's how our life can become so that's why it is can indict we don't let it write can indict because we are busy writing our own little stories in us the secret spirit can indict a page and summary of the infinite infinite a nodus of eternity expressed live in an image and a sculptured face so when we live not for those momentary transient time bound things but for the larger sense of the universal within us then basically in us the eternity expresses itself through time beats so that's the whole sense live in an image and a sculptured face this is the image and the sculptured face which can become a godhead representing the greater truth it the bo- human body can become a temple of some vast may it be so namaste